Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the Old Testament book of Proverbs. The Old Testament book of Proverbs in the book of Proverbs chapter number 27. The book of Proverbs chapter number 27. We've been going through this year searching for wisdom and looking through a lot of these wisdom books. And now we've ended up the year going through the book of Proverbs, hitting one of these <laughs> Proverbs every service, hitting a little bit of wisdom here, a little bit of wisdom here, understanding that the book of Proverbs is just a listing of little maximums, a little sayings, concise sayings with huge truth said in a memorable way. And as we've been looking for wisdom, the book of Proverbs has been a great uh, road map to finding wisdom in our lives, practical wisdom, wisdom that we can have and employ into our everyday lives. The book of Proverbs chapter number 27 is where we now find ourselves at. And notice with me, if you don't mind, the book of Proverbs 27 and notice with me in verse number one, the book of Proverbs chapter 27 and verse number one, the Bible says this, boast not thyself of tomorrow for thou knowest not what a day may bring. And if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, would you mark a phrase that we find in the book of Proverbs chapter 27? Proverbs 27 and verse 1, notice that first phrase, boast not thyself of tomorrow. Boast not thyself of tomorrow. And with the Lord's help, we're going to see the principle that we find here in the book of Proverbs about understanding that today is all that we can have guaranteed, that no one has tomorrow guaranteed, boast not thyself of tomorrow. If you don't mind, let's go to the Lord together and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much again for you being a wonderful God. And as we come to you, we're just asking that you would give us wisdom and that you would give us discernment. I'm asking that you would just please help us, Lord, to understand how important it is to use today to its fullest, that none of us have any guarantee of tomorrow. Because of that, it should put fear in us that we need to use the time that we have wisely. Lord, I'm conscious that I need you today in a special way, and I need your wisdom. I need your direction. The best I know how, I surrender myself to you and ask that you fill me with your precious spirit, that you can get your own work accomplished through your word. We're asking that you would put great power and great understanding, and that you would also allow all of the listeners here to be dead to self, to be filled with your spirit, that they could be ready to receive what you would have for us, and that we would just say yes to whatever you would give to us. Glory your own name because of the things that are done, and we love you, and we can trust you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Boast not thyself of tomorrow. This is a simple idea that a lot of times we can look to tomorrow and say, guess what I'm going to do tomorrow? Guess what I'm going to do next week? Guess what I'm going to do a year from now? What am I going to do in 10 for years from now? And we can actually roadmap some things that we have planned. By the way, I want to give a little asterisk here. Planning is not the problem. You should plan. You should do your best to plan and look forward to it. But the idea here is that we could take God out of the equation and that we could live as if we have a hundred more years when none of us in reality have a guarantee of another day. That we don't know what can happen to us. Whether it's a car accident, we could drive home from church services today and be in a car accident and that's it. We could be taken out. It could be something as unseen like a stroke or an aneurysm that we didn't even see coming and hit us and we're gone. None of us have a guarantee of tomorrow. Therefore, we need to be careful of our boasting. Tomorrow, this is what I'm going to do. Tomorrow, this is what I'm going to get accomplished. 
The Bible says, for we know us not what a day may bring forth. It could be something, maybe it's not where it kills you, but it could be something that changes your life. Sometimes for the good, sometimes for the bad. But we don't know what tomorrow may hold. It may be tomorrow uh, <laughs> before tomorrow hits that you have a life-changing offer given to your lap that changes everything. Wouldn't that be wonderful? There are some people that says, well, I don't look forward to tomorrow because tomorrow is going to be just as bad as it is today. Do you know that something can happen today that can change your tomorrow where you actually look forward to your tomorrows? We don't have any guarantee. We don't know what's going to be in our path. Therefore, we got to be careful. Now, we could say the best we know how. This is what I'd like to see get accomplished tomorrow. But we have to be careful about boasting and glorying in it because it may not come to pass. And all that glorying, that boasting that we did comes to naught and becomes great foolishness. You know, the book of James gives a reflection of this. And if you don't mind, let's turn to the book of James in James chapter 4. Remember, James is in the last part of the Bible. If you took the end of the Bible, the book of Revelation, and started turning the other direction inward, you would come to Revelation, Jude, 3 John, 2 John, 1 John, 2 Peter, 1 Peter. Then we come to the book of James. If you find the book of Hebrews, turn the other direction. James is right after that. Now, remember the book of Proverbs is the book of wisdom in the Old Testament. The book of James is the book of wisdom in the New Testament. And the book of James gives us lots of wisdom and actually expounds on many of the principles that we find in the book of Proverbs meant to give us as a practical way of living our lives. Everyone, if you don't mind, have your own copy of the word of God and look with me in the book of James chapter four. Look for yourself what the Bible has to say. The book of James chapter four and notice with me in verse number 13. James chapter four and verse 13, it says, go to now ye that say today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings, and all such rejoicing is evil." Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is a sin. Here, James is addressing those who plan their lives without any thought or regard to God or the work of God. They're planning and they're trying to spread out their future, but God hasn't entered their equation. Now, again, there's nothing wrong with planning. However, when we plan without putting God inside of the equation, that's where everything falls apart. Now, there was a time where Christians would sign letters and correspondence with the initials DV. If you look at old writings, you will see those initials at the end of it where it would say DV. What does this mean? They would have to put them on posters and flyers. What does this mean? Um, the Latin fr it comes from the Latin phrase, Dio Volentini, <laughs> Dio Volentini, which simply means God willing. You see, it was a practice of this from the scriptures that people would say, we're going to have a special meeting. And then they put DV and let you know, God willing, we're going to have this meeting. We're trying to put God in our equation. God willing, this is what we'd like to see done. God willing, this is what I'd like to have done. And it was just something that would do to keep in mind that they didn't have any hope for tomorrow. They were trusting that God was going to guide them in the right plan path as they were planning these things out. If you don't mind, I'd like to use the book of James as a backdrop to try to understand that we're not supposed to boast about tomorrow. First thing I'd like to show you is the folly of counting on the future. The folly for counting on the future. Now, the specific audience here was being addressed to wealthy merchants who would travel all over the ancient world buying and selling in the major um, trade centers of that day. 
Now, because of the extensive shipping involved, it could actually take a year or more to get a business actually functioning. And so that would be a lot of investment putting in a business. And they would put everything, their concentration, their plans, and everything into this. Their sin was not that they were engaged in business. Their sin was not that they were planning. The idea was is that God hadn't entered into their plans, into their thoughts. And they were trying to plan without any recognition that God was involved in here. Notice, if you don't mind, uh, the things that they were planning for. Notice, if you don't mind, as we look in uh, James chapter 4, notice with me in verse number 13. Go to now ye that say today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Notice there were some things that they had figured out in their plans. They had figured out the when. When was the when? Tomorrow. They said, go now and say that today or tomorrow. So they had the win plan. We're going to get this day or tomorrow. We're going to work towards this. They had the where figured out. They said, today or tomorrow, we will go into a city. So they had the when. They had the where. They had the time figured out. Go now today and say today or tomorrow, and we will go into a city and continue there a year. So they had said, we're going to go to this city and we're going to work towards this. Once we're in the city, it's going to take us about a year to get things going. So they're planning ahead. They had the win. When are we going? We're going today or tomorrow. We're going to go to a city. They got the where. They got the time figured out. It's going to take us a year. They had the what figured out. What are they going to do there? Go now, ye that say today or tomorrow, we'll go to such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell. So they had the what figured out. They knew what they were going to do. We're going to get this figured out. We're going to do this. We're going to get this done. We're going to buy and sell. They had the why figured out. Notice why were they going to buy and sell? To get gain. We're going to do all of this. We're going to start our business. We're going to do this. We're going to plan that's going to take a year. We're going to have a realistic view. We're going to put this together for the purpose of us getting gain. We're going to put all of this here. Now, the one thing that they did not have figured, they had figured out the when, the where, the time, the what, and the why. The one thing that they did not have was the who. Who? God was left out of their plans. He was left out of their equation. Again, there's nothing wrong with planning. But when God is left out of our equation, what happens is that things become shipwrecked. Plan, planning without prayer becomes presumptuous. That we presume that God is going to allow us to happen. We presume upon his grace. We presume that we know his plans. And it becomes a very dangerous thing. So in order for us to understand what was wrong with this, we now go further in the book of James and we see the frailty of life. The frailty of life. Notice with me, if you don't mind, in verse, four, uh, verse 14. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. And that's a true statement. They're making plans. But what happens? They're in the ancient world. They're in the Greek area. What happens when you have an earthquake? What happens when you have a volcano? Those things kind of disrupt plans. What happens when you have a terrorist attack? What happens when soldiers come in? What happens if all of the plants die? A lot of things can be factored into that that we don't know. We're just trying to plan the best we can, but we're going to have to depend that God is the one in control. We're going to have to have some trust in him and that we should never presume upon the future. Notice again, verse 14. And whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth a little time and then vanisheth away. Notice we learn two things here. That first of all, life is unpredictable. Without a doubt, life is unpredictable. Then life is unmeasurable. Meaning you don't know how much time you have. The Bible here kind of gives an illustration trying to demonstrate the frailty of life, saying that life is but a vapor. In Wisconsin, getting close to this time of year, we can understand this, that you go outside, take a nice deep breath of the cold frigid air, breathe out, and out comes a vapor. You could see your breath just for a little bit. And that breath just is there and then evaporates away. It's gone. That's it. 
that's how quickly our life is. It's like a vapor. It's there and it's gone. Now, I understand that younger people may not see that. Younger people getting into the 20s, early 20s, they're approaching that. They think they're going to live forever. But you start talking about some of the senior saints and we realize we have less time than what we thought. We look back and say, wow, I just had kids. Now they're going to college. How did this happen? I mean, it just blinked and they're gone. I think every senior saint I've ever talked to has said that. I had my kids and, and then they're gone. I had this and it was gone, a blink of an eye. Time goes quicker than we ever expected. And there's a lots of twists and turns, but it's so frail, it's unpredictable. None of us had all of our plans figured out in high school and followed that plan exactly. None of us followed the plan that we thought we had, that we had our big dreams, our eyes sparkling, and we knew exactly how our life was going to turn out. And then you fast forward to where you are now and go, well, that didn't work. It's because it's unpredictable and it's so frail. The Bible gives several illustrations to try to show us how frail life really is. Our life in the Bible is compared to the Bible says the wind in Job chapter 7. That's what our, wind, our, bi- our life is like. It's like the wind. It blows and then it's gone. And then there was no evidence that it was ever there. It's just there and it was gone. The Bible talks about in the book of 1 Chronicles 29, 15, that our life is like a shadow. Our shadow is there, but you let a light shine upon it. Our shadow's gone. That's it. It's gone. Disappeared. That's it. The Bible says in Psalm 39 verse 5 that our life is like a breath of our hand. The breath is how wide your hand is. That's it. That's all the time you had. It was there and gone. That's it. (laughs) Say, preacher, this isn't encouraging. You're not encouraging at all. You're saying how weak and frail. In order for us to have wisdom, we have to realize that we don't have as much time as we think we do. When we think that we have more time, we procrastinate, we put things off. When we think that we have more time, we make big grandiose plans, but then we don't carry them out. All of us have dreamed big, or at least I hope you dream big, that you had all these things you wanted to get accomplished. Well, how come they're not accomplished? Because we didn't use our time wisely. We could have done a lot more, but things got in the way. Things popped up. Things were unpredictable. Life is so frail and our plans become so frail. And when we make all of these plans outside of God's will, we're going to find those plans are not going to stand. And our life is but a vapor. If you don't mind, we're going to come back to James, but turn with me to another passage, the book of, um, the book of Psalm 90. The book of Psalm and chapter 90. For our church folks, this is a familiar verse because we use it over and over, and I'll explain something more about it in just a second. But Proverb or Psalm 90 is the oldest psalm found in the Bible. It is written shortly after the children of Israel received the cursing of Kadesh Barnea, where they were told by God that everyone 20 years and older was going to pass away. At this time, there are two and a half million. Uh, Hebrew people in the desert and they were told that if you're 20 years and uh, older in the next 40 years that's all you get at maximum the next 40 years you're all going to be dead and another generation is going to come up in fact whether traveling through the wilderness in the book of numbers they are having an equivalent uh, average of 1,000 funerals a day that's quite a bit Death is something that was surrounded them. And as Moses, under the inspiration of uh, the Holy Spirit, is writing this, he gives them a principle in Proverbs, uh, sorry, the book of Psalm, verse 90. Notice with me in verse 12. So, as a conclusion of what he is teaching there, so teach us to number our days. Why? That we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. So teach us to number our days. 
if we understand that we have less days than what we really think, we will use our time wisely. That was the whole purpose of Psalm 90 was to encourage the people to use their time wisely. They don't know how long they have. Every day counts. Some people have in mind that the quality of a life is how long someone lives. But our life is not lived by year by year. Our life is lived day by day. So teach us to number our days. We have the children's choir up here. So let's use children illustration. You remember when the kids put together their great uh, necklace made out of Cheerios or Fruit Loops? And what they did is they put the Fruit Loop in one loop at a time, right? Until it was completed. They completed as much as they had. And they just put it in there bit by bit by bit. What made it a good necklace? Depending on what they put on the necklace, right? If they were trying to make it edible and they put in a bunch of beads and rocks, well, then it's not a good necklace, right? Uh, the, it's what you put on there that made it worth it. We know that what makes a life worth living is what people did with each of the days that they had. If you lived a long time and did nothing with those days, then your life was empty and worthless. However, if you lived a short amount of time, but you made the maximum amount of effort and uh, efficiency with each of those days, you had a life worth living. It matters what you do with each and every day. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. If you could forgive the personal illustration, most people know that in the back of my office, I have three jars. In the center jar is how many days I thought I had when I put it together approximate. So I was presumptuous and put about 40 years worth of days in there. So all those little BBs and put them in there. And what I do is that after each day, I try to decide, did I use my day wisely or did I use it foolishly? And next to that, I have two jars, a blue jar and a red jar. Every day that I used wisely for the Lord, I put in the blue jar. Every day that I wasted and didn't use it for the Lord, I put in the red jar. And this matters because they start building up over time. In fact, at my funeral, when that happens about 100 years from now, hopefully, but when I have my funeral, I'd like for them to bring up the jars and say, he had a life worth living. How do we know? Because he used his days wisely. Here is a visible illustration. So teach us to number our days. There's something to it being able to take that thing and figure out, did I use my day wisely or do I not use my day wisely? Most people get to the place where we don't use it wisely and we don't even think about it. But if you have to stop and think about it, did I use my day wisely? It makes you evaluate what you, life you are living. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. We don't know how long we have. The only thing we can do is, what, is use the day that we have now and use it wisely. We could do nothing about yesterday and I have no power over tomorrow. The only thing I could do is what I have today. And using my day wisely. Knowing that I don't have a guarantee of tomorrow. I don't have any opportunity to procrastinate for tomorrow. The things that I put off I may not get to. I need to use my day wisely. Because if something happened to me and I don't have it tomorrow, did I accomplish all that I could? As we go back to the book of James, let me show you something else. We started off with the folly of counting on the future that we don't have any guarantee of tomorrow. With it, we saw the frailty of life, that life is really frail and fragile. It's like a vapor. It's just like the wind. It's like a shadow. It's like the breath of a hand. It's there and it's gone. That's it. It's all that we have left. So therefore, we need to use every day wisely, knowing that we have no guarantee of tomorrow. <clears throat> Notice, if you don't mind, as we go back to the book of James chapter 4, let's pick it up in verse number 15, and we see the faith needed for today for tomorrow. So we need to live our life by faith today so we can have tomorrow as an opportunity. Notice with me in chapter number four, James four and verse 15. For what ye ought to say 
if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings, and all such rejoicing is evil. One thing we have to understand is that we are not in control of our lives. God is. No amount of money, no amount of influence, no amount of power, no amount of planning can guarantee tomorrow. God is the only one that can grant us another sunrise. God's the only one who could grant us another breath. It is God that does that. Because of that, we need to make sure we're as right with God as possible. Here James is challenging us to demonstrate an attitude of submission to God, to acknowledge that all of our life is to be lived in recognition to the fact that God is in charge of everything. Let's think about this. If you were to die right now, who's the one that determines where you go? We don't have any power of that of ourselves. It is God that has determined whether we go to heaven or whether we go to hell. That makes us realize that we can't do it ourselves. What do you mean by this preacher? Well, there's some people that think that they have enough control that they think that that life is such a way that it's like a scale system. That if I die and my good works somehow outweigh my bad, I'll be able to slide right into heaven. With that, it sounds comforting because it feels like I have some sort of control of what happens to me. But I don't. You see, God has set up a different standard. His standard is quite simple that we have to be perfect. That we can't do anything wrong in order to go to heaven. But the Bible's clear. It says we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. None of us deserve to go to heaven. That means the control is now outside of our hands. None of us deserve to go to heaven. We have no control. But God, because he loves us, has decided to give us an option where he has done all the work. What do you mean by that? Well, God, who loves us, stepped down from the glories of heaven and robed himself in flesh as the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus lived the same life that you and I lived. He went through the same temptations, the same troubles, the same heartbreaks. Then he died on the cross to pay for your sins and to pay for mine. He died on the cross, was buried on a borrowed tomb. On the third day, he rose again. When Jesus rose again, it proved two things. It proved, first of all, that Jesus was God and it proved that God was satisfied with the payment that was made. And that all we have to do is receive that gift. We don't have any control of ourselves. God did all the work. The only thing that we could do is receive what God has done for us. I can't force myself into heaven. I cannot make myself worthy enough to go to heaven. I am very limited in what I can do. The only thing I can do is accept the free gift that God has given to me. Someone can say, well then preacher, can you know for sure that you're going to heaven? Absolutely I can. The Bible says in 1 John 5, 13, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that you have eternal life. I like that word know. I'm a scientist by nature. That word know means to have knowledge of by evidence. And I'm thankful for that. That I have accepted God's gift, but it's not just by faith. It is by evidence that God said, here is evidence. And he's given us all sorts of evidence. We're going to go through a series in a couple of years called Things That Accompany Salvation. That when we get saved, we just don't get salvation. But there are things that accompany that salvation that gives us evidence that we're one of his. Isn't that wonderful? In fact, <clears throat> the Bible talks about that there's proof and evidence that I've accepted him as my savior. And I'm thankful for that. But I didn't do any of that myself. It's what God did. Maybe I could illustrate that. The Bible says in John chapter 3, Jesus is talking to a man by the name of Nicodemus. And he says, verily, verily, ye must be born again. Well, Nicodemus scratched his old silver head and said, I don't get it. It's not like I could crawl back in a mom. How does this work? And Jesus says, we have to have two births. We have to have a physical birth 
and we have to have a spiritual birth. And just as real as that physical birth was, that spiritual birth is just as real. For example, if my daughter went to my, went to my wife, her mother, and said, Mom, was I born? My wife would laugh at her. Of course you were born. But mom, how do you know I was born? I was there. All right? And she could give a time and a place. She could explain the events. I have three kids and we could tell you the events that led up to each one of their births. Whether it was Serena where we got there in time and the epidural worked and it was a big ladies party that was making fun of her husband the whole time and they just had a good time. We remember the events. Or we go to uh, my son who we got there and they didn't turn the epidural on quite the right time. And so there was a little bit of pain and whatnot. Then we had the other one where they just didn't do the epidural. To, and uh, each one of them had their own events with how it felt with her. Each one of those were a different feeling for each one of them. And uh, each one had the events of where it led to where we didn't need any babysitter for Serena because she was our first one. Our second one, we needed a babysitter. Our third one, we couldn't find anyone who wanted to watch our son. But there was medical things going on. But there was things going on. Each one had an event leading up to it. But there was a point, action, and time where they were born. It was a real event. Well, just as real as them being born, the same thing is true about being born again. It is a real event. For example, I'm thankful that I had the privilege of knowing, getting to know Jesus Christ as my Savior at a vacation Bible school in Dallas, Texas that someone invited me to go to a vacation Bible school and I went there Monday, I went there Tuesday, I went there Wednesday, I went there Thursday, and I went there Friday. And I remember where I was sitting at on that Friday afternoon in August in Dallas, Texas, when a preacher loved me enough to open up the Bible and show me from the Bible that I was a sinner. Now I was a young child, but I didn't need to be convinced that I was a sinner. I knew I was a sinner. He also showed me that because of my sin, I deserved to be separated from God to an awful place called hell. And I knew at the young age, I didn't want to go there. But he also loved me enough to show me from the Bible that Jesus paid my price. And I remember where I was at when I bowed my head and I accepted Jesus as my savior. And it saved me at that time. I was delivered from hell. I was now bought into God's family. I was now born again. What happens when you're born again? Well, the Holy Spirit, who is God, comes to move inside of me and becomes a part of me. I get all of the Holy Spirit I'm ever going to get at that moment that I accept Jesus as my Savior. Praise the Lord for that. And that God has said in the book of Ephesians that he gives us the earnest of the Spirit. I am sealed with the Spirit. What does that mean? The earnest of the Spirit, earnest is something we, it's a financial term. If I was to buy a house, I would give earnest money. That earnest money shows that I'm serious about buying that house. I'm, I'm serious about it. Well, God promised to bring me to heaven. How do I know he's going to keep, uh, keep that promise? The Holy Spirit, who is God, is now inside of me and is part of me as evidence that God will keep his word. And one day when I die, the Holy Spirit's going to go up to heaven and I, who is part of the Holy Spirit, is going to go up with him. It's the Holy Spirit's job to bring me up to heaven. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, I'm sealed by the Spirit. What does that mean? A seal is a kind of a stamp. It's something they would do in the ancient world. They would put wax down and they would have a seal that would be stamped on it to show its authority. The Holy Spirit living inside of me is God's seal that I'm born again and he's going to carry out his promise. There's evidences of my salvation. There's proof of it. Now I'm thankful for that because there are some people that says, I'm just going to wait and let God sort it out. If you wait till God sorts it out, it's already too late. The Bible says in J uh, the book of 1 John chapter 2, that we have an advocate with the father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. That word advocate means lawyer. When I go preach at jails, the, all of the inmates understand you hire your lawyer before you go to court, right? Uh, they, they're able to figure that out. When do you accept Jesus as your savior? Before you face him at the judgment. That makes sense. Now is the accepted time. Now's the thing. But yet I'll find people time to time that says, 
I'll do it later. I'm going to wait till the last moment. I'm going to have my fun. I'm going to enjoy my life. And then right before I die, I'll accept Jesus as my savior. May I tell you, as we go back to the message, you have no guarantee of tomorrow. You have no guarantee of a slow death. You can go outside, out of here, have a semi truck hit you that you didn't see and have no opportunity to accept Christ as your savior. Now is the accepted time. Now is the time to get it settled. Now is the time because you have no guarantee of tomorrow. Now's the time to get it settled because of the frailty of life, because we have no guarantee of tomorrow. Now, if we want to have any guarantee of tomorrow, we need to get things settled today. If we're going to have the faith to live tomorrow, things need to be settled now. Which now brings us to the conclusion. Notice with me in verse 17, and we can see the fervency of today's obedience. The fervency of today's obedience. Notice with me back in James chapter 4. And notice with me in verse 17. Notice the very first word is therefore. In the Bible, whenever you see the word therefore, you need to see what it is therefore. It is tying a conclusion to what it's already taught. What's being taught? That we have no guarantee of tomorrow. Because... (laughs) God is in control. We're not. We need to not take it for granted. We need to use today wisely. So therefore, because of this teaching, therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him that is sin. Have you ever noticed that when you procrastinate to do something good, you end up doing something wrong? When you procrastinate to do something good, you do something wrong. You try to procrastinate to do the right thing, you end up doing the wrong thing. Knowing what should be done obligates a person to do it. Someone would say, I know I need to accept Christ. I know I need to, but I'll do it later. You know what you're actually saying is, no God, I will not accept you now. If God gives us something to obey right now, no God, I will do this tomorrow. You're telling God no. Now's the time to say yes. If you know it's something you should do, you should do it today while you have the opportunity because you have no guarantee you could do it tomorrow. Something else may pop in. You may not even be here. Today is the day to do what you know is to do right. Today is the day to get it settled. I meet people all the time that says, you know, I know I need to read my Bible, but I'll get to it eventually. What you're saying is, no, God, I will not obey you today. Well, you know, I know I need to be at church Sunday morning and Sunday night, but I've got other things to do. What you're doing is you're telling God no. You see, this stacks up. We have to develop the habit of saying yes while we have the opportunity and while we have the chance to do it. Putting this off, procrastinating, even good things causes us to do the wrong thing. Therefore, because of this teaching, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Now is the accepted time. We keep putting things off. If you could allow (laughs) the, the characterization, every single one of us procrastinate things. Every one of us know there are things that we should do. You know, we, we hear about things too. You know, even, even the world is conscious that we don't have tomorrow. That's why they have songs and movies trying to tell people, say, I love you to your loved ones because you'll never know when you have a chance. That's actually wise. Take advantage of those opportunities to call someone. You may not have that guarantee. It is amazing how easy it is once you procrastinate once to procrastinate twice. And the third time. And develop that habit of procrastination. Now's the only time that we have. That we have the ability. That we know that we can get something done. To obey the Lord. To tell someone that you love them. To show someone that you care. To do what is right. 
therefore, because life is frail, because we know we have no guarantee of tomorrow, because of this, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him that is sin. Now, what do you do with such a message? First of all, if you don't know for sure that Jesus Christ is your personal Savior, you don't know without a doubt from the Bible that you're going to heaven, don't procrastinate. We're going to give what is called an invitation. There's nothing magical that happens here. We just want to invite you to respond. And it would be our great privilege to take of the Bible and show you from the Bible how you can know without a doubt that your sins are forgiven. If you don't know for sure that you're going to heaven, don't put it off. You have no guarantee you'll have an opportunity like this ever again. Now's the accepted time. For those of you who know that there are some things you need to do in your Christian life, oh, I'll get to my Bible reading eventually. I know I should do this. What you need to do is that you need to make a decision that you're going to do it today. When are you going to do it today? Now's the time to start taking advantage of the opportunity you have to obey. Maybe some of you have someone that you don't know for sure is going to heaven, a friend or a family member. And you say, I'll talk to him eventually. I'm working up the courage. Maybe you need to stop procrastinating and just get it done. Go talk to them. Get that opportunity now because you have no guarantee that you'll ever have this chance ever again. Using our time wisely, not procrastinating. We have no guarantee of tomorrow. What is it that you are supposed to do? What is it that God has given you to do today? As long as you're breathing, God has something for you. That the Christian life is not a spectator sport. What is it that God has given you to do today that needs to get done? Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 530-6308. Once again, that number is 920-530-6308. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.